Our Father in heaven, we pray and ask that you would be among your people this morning as we gather here to worship you, to call on your name for much needed help, to hear from your word for much needed truth to transform our lives. We pray that we would love and adore you, that we would love one another from the heart, that we would love each other, not just in word, but by our deeds as well. We pray as we consider uh, this chapter from Practical Religion, oh God, that you would work in us, that you would convict us, that you would grow us and change us and shape us more into the likeness and the image of your Son. We pray this in his name. Amen. So, chapter 3 in Practical Religion is entitled... Ugh, Something's wrong with my pulpit. It is not its title, but it is entitled uh, Reality. And so, uh, what does Mr. Ryle mean by reality? He says, well, if we profess to have any religion at all, let us take care that it is real. I say it emphatically, and I repeat the saying, let us mind that our religion is real. So what does... Um, I'm going to aim for, for more interaction, presupposes there was some interaction in the previous two weeks. I want some interaction, trying to figure out a way to teach this with interaction involved. So, uh, in what ways could real be used in that sense? What is, there's two different meanings it could have. What does it mean whether your religion is real or not? Interaction. Oh, okay. Well, you just volunteered. Thank you. What is uh, <laughs> I Yeah, I would. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So real as opposed to fake. There's another sense in which it could be used. You've already landed on the one he means in the chapter, but there's another sense. A real religion versus a false religion. So a real religion as opposed to a false religion, uh, an example of that would be Mormonism. Like obviously, if you were talking with a Mormon person, and you would want them to examine their faith to see if it was indeed real or correspondent with reality, and trust that they would find out that it wasn't. Um, the other sense is real as opposed to fake or hypocritical religion. Now, that is primarily his emphasis in this chapter, wanting us to see whether or not our faith is hypocritical. Um, so the chapter got way less fun after I realized that. Scripture proofs for this section. So basically, this, this idea of can your religion claim to be something that it is indeed not. So you give several scripture proofs. Jeremiah 6.30, uh, rejected or false silver, they are called. The Lord has rejected them. The idea is they claim to be one thing, but aren't. Uh, Mark 11.13, and seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. So this idea of having leaf but no fruit, having the promise of something without the substance of it. 1 John 3, 18, little children, let us not love in word or talk. The sense would be only to say to your brother or sister, like, I love you. I would give you anything. And then not. Um, kind of that, that sense of be warm and be filled. Uh, Revelation 3, verse 1, I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. So clearly, just at a brief glance at God's word, this idea of hypocrisy or claiming to be one thing while not being that thing is clearly uh, something that is taught over and over and over again. So if we were to ask or tease out what is Mr. Ryle looking for in that idea of is it real or is it not, he's asking basically, is your religion something that is genuine? So all of the ands are him. I don't do that myself, but he loved them. So genuine, 
and sincere and honest and thorough. What he does not mean is religion that is base and hollow and formal or uh, all form and no substance, just going through the hoop, and false and counterfeit and a sham and nominal or in name only. So that, that, that's what he's zeroing in on. The question that he wants us to ask throughout the chapter is, is the faith that I claim to have genuine, sincere, honest, and true, or is it just something that I claim to have but don't really have? He says real religion is not mere show and pretense and skin-deep feeling and temporary profession and outside work. It is something inward, solid, substantial, intrinsic, living, last. And then the parts where he should put ands, he doesn't. I don't get this guy. <clears throat> so uh, he does give a slight disclaimer because early on you can be like, oh, this is just going to be a wretchedly convicting chapter. And it is. Um, but he isn't saying, is your religion perfect? His question is, is it real? It might be weak feeble and mingled with many infirmities, that is not the point before us today. Is our religion real? Is it true? What he's, what he's asking for is, is not, is your, religion, is your religion perfect? If that were the question, every one of us would have to say, uh, no, it is not. <laughs> All of our religion is fraught with imperfections, weaknesses, impurities. His question is really, is, are, are we hypocrites primarily? You can see why he had so many friends. The importance of real religion. Did Jesus give any parables to this topic? Real faith versus hypocritical faith. If so, what are some of the parables that come to mind? The sower and the seed? Absolutely. The parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. The wedding feast, primarily the garment. Of the wedding feast, I believe. The wise and foolish builders, 100%. Me, others. Many more. There's one I don't think we'll get the dragnet. Weed and the tares, I think. Let me see. There's a list of some of them. And you guys got, oh, the Great Supper. Uh, would be another one where people are welcome into a feast and um, don't come, and then someone's thrown out. Did Jesus ever say anything about hypocrisy? No. Hinted at it a few times, beat around the bush mainly. Um, so yeah, m most of his parables have to do with this idea, is it a real faith or a false faith? That should alarm us, or at least make us aware of like, wow, this is a, it's a big topic. This is probably something that we're going to deal with, and probably something that we struggle with. And if then we just say, well, did he, he, he talked about it parabolically. Did he talk about it kind of like head on? <laughs> it's called Matthew 23, um, among other places. You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? We didn't beat around the bush about the severity or the seriousness of it. Mr. Ryle picked that verse, not me, just in case you were wondering. So Jesus speaks about it often in parables, and he talks directly to it. And in fact, he seems to have a way bigger problem with Pharisees, who are hypocrites, than those who were prostitutes and tax collectors. At least the first, or at least the latter, knew they were sinners. The, the the Pharisees didn't believe that they were. So, if we consider, um, it seems that all the graces have counterfeits. Um, that should also alarm us. That uh, maybe the a way of saying it would be this: religion can be fake. Can in fact, at almost every point, it can be fake. Uh, is there such a thing as real or unreal repentance? What would that be? Yeah, worldly sorrow. What would be a, a biblical illustration of someone who sought for it with tears but didn't receive it? Yeah, Judas. Yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, Esau sought for repentance and didn't find it. Is there a worldly sorrow for the consequence of sin that can look like repentance but isn't repentance? Yeah. Is there such a thing as unreal faith? What is it? Mr. Lucasen. There's honey barrels, that's for sure. Not the example I was expecting, but a good one. Is there such a thing as unreal holiness? If so, what is it? Sherwin, what do you think that is? Mm -hmm. What well, would be a, like a brand of religious practice that would be really good at that. But maybe like fundamentalist circles look like that. Really pristine on a Sunday. And uh, home's a wreck. What's that? Uh, yeah, some versions of Catholicism. Caitlin? Ten times louder. The Pope. I guess we could just say that at many of these, but uh, <laughs> uh, unreal love or charity. It's a way to have unreal love or charity. Yeah. Wholesale redefining it. Um, love re redefining love to be what, what the Bible would call hate, to not speak truth. Um, or only loving or ch or giving charity uh, when recognition is involved or recompense is possible. So conditioned or uh, false. Is there such a thing as unreal humility? Yep. <laughs> yeah, so the, the publican who prayed next to the, or no, the Pharisee who prayed next to the publican was very thankful to the Lord that he could even tie that of his spice rack. Uh, is there such a thing as unreal praying? Once again, the Pharisee and the publican <laughs> said he prayed to himself. Uh, is there a way that we could pray and it's just speaking words? Uh, the book of James says that Elijah was a man who prayed in his prayers, which would seem to insinuate that there's a way to not pray in your prayers. To maybe talk to the people listening, but not to God. Uh, or just praying to salve a conscience. I put an asterisk on this one because Mr. Wilde uh, didn't include it, but is, is there an unreal way to read your Bible? Yeah, just going through the motions. Um, being really faithful. To, and I'm, I'm pro-praying and pro-Bible reading, um, but there's a false way to do it. And one would be just to have the reading plan to check the boxes and to have it be the stature thing. Uh, is there unreal worship? Yes. Back to either gross or grievous um, abuses, like putting glitter into the air duct system so it blows glory cloud. Uh, or to come in and sing the songs without a mind and heart engaged. I would call that unreal worship. Um, for me, the hardest songs to sing are the ones I know the best. It's just, it's autopilot. Um, unreal talking about religion. You can talk a really good game, um, but it's not in the heart. He would say at the end of this, be genuine, be thorough, be real, be true. That's what our religion should be. Genuine. Thorough, not cutting corners, real, not false, and true, not fake. Uh, he says, often what is called real religion is nothing more than churchmanship. What do you think he means by churchmanship? Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. He knows all the rules by which this elaborate game is played. He knows what to say and what not to say, how to dress, how not to dress. He knows, he knows the, the, the way that this game is played and he plays it well, rather than it being heart deep. Um, often real religion is nothing more than ritualism or dissent. Now he, because of his specific church context, he starts with those dissenters. And you kind of have to tease out, like, what? what? Um, basically what he says is some things fly under the flag, real religion, and we'll just start with ritualism because I think it's, it's easier to see, and then we'll go to dissenting. Those whose religion is just form, it's bells and smells and protocol. Um, one of the oddest things that I ever went to was, uh, I, part of me loved it, part of me didn't love it, which was, uh, Michael, what's the name of the service at St. Mark's? you took me to? Compline? I thought you said Coughlin. I was like, no, that is not it. Compline service. Uh, lovely liturgy. The, the theology that was being sung at St. Mark's was deep, thorough, rich, but sung and, per and participated by people who did not believe it. It was so weird. To have so much beauty and rich theology performed by, by folks who maybe didn't fully believe it, but loved the, the feel of religion. And a bunch of college kids like brought pillows and blankets and laid down, and it was weird. Uh, dissent. <laughs> um, so if formalism is a way that we can convince ourselves that a religion is, is real, sometimes people slingshot over to the other extreme, and it's like we have no rules no creed but the Bible. There's no protocols. It's just organic. And you're like, uh, not well thought out and maybe organic. But they, they almost revel in, we have no traditions. We have no, we literally don't even think about this. And you're like, well, maybe you should a little bit. But um, there's those two extremes that can go under the banner of real religion. Um, this one's like a little closer to home. Nothing more than loving or the love of being right. Um, and to give a little more explanation, Mr. Ryle says they will talk loudly of soundness in the faith and have a keen nose for heresy, familiar with all the phrases of religion, fluent in leading doctrines. So they are book nerds. They scour blogs. They love online debate. They are warriors on the Twitter sphere. Um, but if you look about it, they love the fight, and they love being right, and they love beating other people at arguing. But at the heart of who and what they are, is it real? Possibly. Possibly not. But so much that goes under it is not. Yes? It, it could be, I was thinking more of just like raging Calvinists kind of what I was thinking about. Yeah, the last point, the love of being right. Oh, yes. Yes. There's Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And there's and there's there's people on on both sides of that where it's like the newer calvinistic being very obnoxious and loud and rebelling against a lot of stuff. Uh, and then there's also like the uh, really stuffy 1689 guys, um, which is really sad because I, I love that statement of faith, but some people are, are real not sweethearts about it. Uh, the test of whether religion is real or not. How can we tell if, oh, so this is the second point. We got done talking about the importance of it. So hopefully we all are convinced that it is important. <laughs> Let's go to how do we test to see whether or not religion is indeed real or false. How can we tell? He says, uh, dismiss from your mind the common idea that of course all is right if you go to church or to chapel. Cast away such vain notions uh, forever. He spells it that way, so I spelt it that way. Just wanted you to be aware. Uh, believe me, it's no light matter. It is your life. So he says, don't, don't assume, yeah, I see these problems with people out there. 
and, I, and there's a lot of people in my mind who should read this book. He says, no, 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 no. Ask yourself. Don't assume that our religion and our um, carrying out of it is in perfect alignment. Uh, hypocrisy is very sneaky and can be found in, in and it is, I believe, found in all of us. Uh, so number one, what place, so he says, he, here's some questions you can ask yourself to, to tease out in your own heart. Is my religion real or is it hypocritical? He's not saying, is it perfect? He's saying, is it true, thorough, genuine, and true? What place does religion have in the inner man? He says, you may know the truth and assent to the truth and believe the truth and yet be wrong in God's sight. It is not enough that it is on your lips. Your religion must be in your heart. It must sway your affections uh, and your will. What do you think he means by that question? Um, what place does it have in the inner, in the inner heart or inner man? What's he driving at? Is it actually changing? Yep. Is this something not just that you say with your mouth, and not even just something, and I think this is where we would get uncomfortable on the reform side, not just something that you think in your mind, but does it actually work its way into your affections. That's, that's, the, that's the key tell. It's one thing to say that, yeah, I believe these things. It's another thing to say, okay, are they actually shifting your affections, the things you love? Are they actually shifting your will, the, the, the stuff you do? Or is it just talk? That's an uncomfortable question. Um, how can we tell if our religion is real? What are your feelings towards sin? He says, the Christianity which is from the Holy Spirit will always have a deep view of the sinfulness of sin. And he goes on to say that it needs to be more. Notice he didn't say, what are your thoughts about sin? we can have all the right theology of it. We can, we could wax eloquently about total depravity and that the least sin is an infinite offense against an infinitely holy God. And it, it deserves an infinite amount of wrath. And that's why hell is eternal. And that's why I mean, we, which I mean, all that stuff is true and good to know, but does it work its way down into the affections so that we feel the sinfulness of our sin? That's, that's that link again between, is it just in the mind or is it working its way down into the heart? Number three, what are your feelings towards Christ? So kind of the, that counter opposite to, uh, to sin, do you hate sin? Conversely, do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? Nominal religion may believe that such a person existed, speaking of Christ, and was a great benefactor to mankind. It may show him some external respect, attend his outward ordinances, so kind of do the stuff he said, and bow the head in his name. What would that be? Prayer? Yeah. But it goes no further. So how can you tell if religion is real or hypocritical? Maybe the most potent litmus test is to consider Jesus Christ and say, what, are you, what is your love for him? Is he your savior whom you love? Do you, would you echo some of the statements um, found in scripture, like in the Song of Songs, fairer more than 10,000? Would you read that and say, yes, that's him? Or, it, or does it just stay at, he's a Savior, he's the Lord, he came, and, and that's it. That is a difficult one. I think I just had that one. Oh, wait, there's more goodness. Uh, real religion will make a man glory in Christ. 
as the Redeemer, the Deliverer, the Priest, the Friend, without whom he would have no hope at all. What he would say is, affections and his life and all that he is and all that he has is summed up in Christ. Uh, number four, what is the fruit or what, what fruit is it producing? I can read. What, pr what fruit is it producing in your heart? Real religion will produce in the man who has it repentance, faith, hope, charity, humility, spirituality, kind temper, self-denial, unselfishness, patience, forbearance. What is this getting to the root of in its question? What is, what is Mr. Ryle asking at this point? Besides just rereading the question. Yeah. What, what do we call, uh, what, what would be a theological term to describe number four? Sanctification. Are you growing in whose likeness? Christ's likeness. So often what we do is when we think of sanctification, we think of just these rules and regulations that are kept rather than conformity to a person. And the person is Christ. So can you look at your life and say, I mean, it's quite a, um, a huge claim. I mean, try, go, try going down your street, knocking on the door, and asking them if they're an unbeliever. Find one. And tell them that the Spirit of God Himself dwells in you. They probably think you're a loon. <laughs> and they say, well, how do you know? One of the, one of the things is say, I'm, I'm not what I used to be. He's changed me. It's not that I've changed myself. He's changed me. I used to love things that I now hate. And I used to hate things that I now love. And I'm growing in these things, not to earn his favor, but because his favor has been set on me. Um, this, is, this is one that we sand the edges off of pretty hard in American evangelicalism. Uh, we're, we're very afraid of being called legalistic. When in fact, it's simple, all we're simply talking about is growth in Christ-likeness. That's, that's, <laughs> that's what we're talking about. We're not law-keeping so that we earned or deserve God's favor or add to that. What we're saying is, He saved me from sin. Why would I play around with it? With that which destroyed me, or could have destroyed me. And now I say I love Christ, I want to pursue Him. That's what we mean by sanctification. Uh, fifthly, I think this is a, a kind of a two-part question. <clears throat> Your relationship to the public means of grace. What would come to your mind now? He's not using means of grace in the tightest, strictest theological category. But what would come to your mind for public means of grace? Corporate singing? Yep. What else? Yep, so public prayer. Uh-huh. Communion would be a public one. Yep. We could add to it the other sacrament, baptism. Anything else? Ah, there we go. Preaching as well. <laughs> he says, what are your feelings about public prayer, public praise, and the public preaching of God's word? And the administrations of the Lord's Supper, are they things to which you give a cold assent and tolerate them as proper and correct? Or are they things in which you take pleasure without which you could not live happy? So that is a soul-searching question. When it comes to these, um, he'll get to the private means of grace as well. But when it comes to these public means of grace, he, he's asking, is, is this just something you do? Or does it work its way down into the heart and the soul of who you are? So how many of you remember uh, when we first had the two weeks to flatten the curve? 
Less of you have repressed those memories. <laughs> uh, remember, we canceled services here for seven weeks. How was that? It was not fun. How was going without the supper for seven long weeks? Excruciating. Some of the hardest weeks of my life. And also thank God for you as well. I was, I was encouraged to hear as a pastor that it was not uh, just like, oh, well, hey. <laughs> you know, we stayed home in our jammies. Um, it should be difficult. It should be difficult. Uh, when we stay home because we're sick, that is not fun. <laughs> I, I, apart from the being sick part. Um, it should be difficult for us. It shouldn't be something that we take or leave. Because, not because of um, it's a box we check. We recognize it for what it is. It is a way that God grows his people and nourishes us and cares for us and cherishes his people and draws them to himself. And to go without that for even a week should be... Um, very difficult to bear. There is the other side of things. How about the private means of grace? What are some private means of grace? Bible reading would be one. Prayer would be another. Yeah, private worship. Yep. Confession. Yep. Anything else? It says, what are your feelings about the private means of grace? Do you find it essential now when he means comfort, he, he is not thinking a modern American context like, oh, I'm so comfortable. Uh, he's talking about an afflicted soul that finds its comfort and its peace in God. Do you find it essential to your comfort to read the Bible regularly in private and to speak to God in prayer? Or do you find these practices irksome and either slur them over or neglect them altogether? If means of grace, whether public or private, are not a necessity to your soul, as meat and drink are to the body, you may well doubt whether your religion is real. Um, so he says, like, what is your relationship with these means of grace? Now, I'm very thankful he didn't say as salad and drink to the soul, because I, I could do without that. But meat is definitely, feel the pain of that. Um, do we feel it when we miss Bible reading on a day? Not just because we're OCD about some stuff and didn't get to check the box that said we did it, because <laughs> there's that part of it. Um, but the, the sense of, I didn't hear from my God today. Or prayer. Prayer is, is sadly the easier one of those two to miss. I haven't spoken to him today. I haven't poured out my soul to him. My soul is troubled, and I need to speak with him. Um, I, I have found prayer to be a safe hiding place that um, has just been sweet in seasons. There's dry seasons as well. But the dry seasons should certainly alarm us should alarm us. So when we look at these aspects of, of means of grace, we look at our relationship to them, if it's a, yeah, I could take or leave it relationship, that should bother us. It should afflict our consciences and say something is horribly wrong. Now what he's not saying is like, do you do this perfectly? Obviously we'd all say like, uh, no. Um, but he's saying, is, is, is there substance there or is there not substance there? A couple applications. <clears throat> the first one is for the person who doesn't even want to ask the question about whether their religion is real or not. To the person who's not self-reflective at all. They just, they don't want to think these things through. They don't want to ask themselves, is it real or is it hypocritical? I don't really care either way. He would say, consider whether or not your religion is uh, real or not. And then he goes on to say, 
you're playing around with your own soul to not ask such questions. If you go through all of life not concerned about what, if, whether or not your religion is real or not, um, if that's where you're at, that is a telltale sign your religion is not real, that you don't have any care or concern about your soul, and you are on a one-way collision course with God's wrath and judgment. You should turn and repent and believe in Christ. The second is to the one who would go through those tests and their conscience is afflicted because they ran face to face uh, into uh, many areas of hypocrisy. Uh, to the one in their conscience, um, or who knows in their conscience that religion is false, turn to Christ and away from the destruction that you're headed towards. So th this is a person who's going through all of the right hoops and checking the right boxes and doing the right things and maybe coming to church with your parents and going to the right school or doing the right, all of that. But they know in their heart of hearts it's just a thing that we do. Mr. Ryle says, turn away from that because that's the path of destruction. Uh, to those uh, who are uh, really saved but are convicted because they go, you know, man, th those questions uh, were very uncomfortable because they asked, they, they, they poked and pushed and confronted some hypocrisy in my life. Uh, to those who are convicted, cease from all trifling and playing with religion. And to become honest, thoroughgoing, wholehearted follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Never be content to wear the cloak of religion. Be all that you profess to be. Though you err, be real. So his, excuse me, his, his um, exhortation to those who would look at their life and say, man, I see places in my life where I'm playing the game. I see areas where, thank God it is real, but I see other areas where I'm, it's like playing a game. I, I know the rules, and I play at it. He says, uh, don't do that. <laughs> Turn away from that. Don't wear the cloak of religion. Uh, but if you say that's what you are, be that. Even though, even though it is not perfect, have it be real. Uh, number four, to those whose religion is real. Didn't say perfect. Didn't say flawless. But when you looked at the, the test, you went, you know what? The means of grace are indispensable to me. They are real meat and real drink. Um, the, my love for Christ is heart deep. Uh, my hatred of sin is growing. He would encourage each and every one to continue on and to not be discouraged by difficulties and opposition. Basically, the way he ends this chapter is to say that such a faith, will be opposed from within and without. And there will be seasons of trial in your life that will push on that and pressure you. Your schedule will try to choke out private means of grace. Uh, maybe societal pressures will try to choke out public means of grace. Um, or, or maybe relational difficulties, or, or wherever the difficulty comes from, they will try to get us to sand off the edges of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or in our um, faithful obedience to him. And he says, do not be discouraged by those difficulties in opposition. Our, our Savior promised they would happen, so let us not be surprised when they do. Is there anything which a man ought to do, th if there's anything, excuse me, if there is anything which a man ought to do thoroughly, really, truly, honestly, and with all his heart, it is the business of the soul. Believer in Christ, remember this. Whatever you do in religion, do it well. Be real, be thorough, be honest, be true. Any thoughts or comments before we close in prayer? All right. Let's pray. Father, we pray as we've been exhorted to think and consider today 
may our following after you not be all talk, but the core of who we are, our hearts, our soul, and the inner man. May these things be true of us. Father, we pray that you would faithfully, and in asking we also pray gently, uh, root out the hypocrisy in our life. We don't want to love you with a divided heart. We want to love you with a whole heart. So Father, we pray that our religion would be real and thorough and honest and true. We pray this in our Savior's name. Amen.